Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 330. Have Social Security payments ever been cut for people who were already receiving them? How does Social Security work with CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System? And how do Social Security survivor benefits work? Plus, what retirement accounts should you save into in what order? You remember John, the former chickens owner? He wants to know about sequence of savings, and he tells the backstory on those chickens. And you got your LIFO and your FIFO and your LILO. How should you withdraw from your brokerage account in retirement. Also, more on paying the tax on a Roth conversion, as well as overfunding a 529 education savings plan and a strategy to refinance your house and deduct interest. I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson, CFP, and Big Al Clopine, CPA. Gary from La Mesa. Hello. I love the show. I presently, um, I'm presently watching the May 16th show on Social Security. I wanted to ask. Has the government ever reduced benefits from those already received them? Uh, the point being is there is a discussion of reduced benefits being a possibility beginning in 2035. A reduction is projected to be 21 to 30 percent of current planned benefits. With that in mind, would it be better to claim early before 2035 as a strategy to avoid that possible reduction? If we're in, in act, if it were enacted. And I had to wait until age 67 or 70 to claim my benefits. Thank you. And I hope this question makes sense. Yeah. So Gary's watching the old TV show. Looks like. Sure. Yeah. And he's thinking, well, 2035, the trust fund's going to be exhausted. Yeah. And it says right on your statement that the benefits, if nothing else happens, will be reduced by 21 to 29%. What do you think? Do you think they would reduce existing so, well, beneficiaries me, yeah. benefit. Well, let me, I'll go through his questions. Have they ever done this before? No, they've never reduced benefits for people that have been promised. Uh, is there a possibility? Yes. <laughs> in fact, it says right in that the the your statement, which is if nothing changes, this is the projected benefits that you receive. So it could happen. Is it likely to happen? In my opinion, no. The reason it's not likely to happen is there's ways to fix Social Security, like raising the percentage to be collected by 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 uh, making it later on a on a uh, full age retirement benefit, by raising the cap on how much uh, how much you make to for Social Security. There's lots of ways to fix it. In general, it's um, it's politically unpopular to do, so these things tend to get fixed right towards the end. Right. And we've had we've been in front of these situations before. So I don't think it's going to happen. I wouldn't change my my claiming strategy just because of that. But that's my opinion. I agree, Al. Uh, I agree with everything you said. OK, there you so, go. All right. So we got another Social Security uh, question here. OK, let's see. My wife has worked 10 plus years uh, to earn her Social Security benefit. Plus, she is a school teacher that has contributed into CalPERS. Are you allowed to take both benefits when you retire? Uh, Robert from Escondido writes in, is it CalPERS or CalSTRS? So there's two different. And if she's in CalPERS, is she still contributing to Social Security? Where some CalPERS pensions, you have CalPERS and you're still putting into Social Security. So you're allowed to have both. If it is Cal stirs because she's a teacher, um, which I'm guessing in your Escondido, unless she's an aide. Um, if it's Cal stirs, she's going to get wept windfall elimination provision um, because she's not going to receive the full benefit, even though she has 10 plus years in Social Security. If she has Cal stirs, that benefit will be reduced. So, if it's Cal PERS, so, so it depends it which depends. one it really is. And most teachers are Cal Sturs, right? Yes, unless you're like an aide, okay, or okay, you know, so, some other category of of um, educator. Right. So, all right. Hopefully that helps. We got Perry from Jersey. I don't know where, where to even begin with this question, so maybe I skip Jersey. <laughs> is that how we wrote the question, Andy? Yes, it is. Yes, the, the first well, part is from the Social Security website. He's, he's quoting the Social Security website, and then he's, he's suggesting that it seems like it conflicts. So he's asking which one is right. Okay. It's actually not bad. Give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> this is from the Social Security. It says SSA form. If you are a survivor slash SSA. 
Okay, that's the heading. So he went to the Social Security website. Cut and paste. And, and saw that heading. And then there's, here's, it says, these are examples of the benefits that survivors may receive. Then he gives a couple. All right, widow or widower, full retirement, age or older. 100% of the deceased workers benefit amount. Okay. Okay, so if I'm a widow or widower at full retirement age or older, I would receive 100% of the deceased workers benefit amount. Do you yep. agree with that? Yes. Okay. Widow or widower, age 60, full retirement age, 71 and a half to 99% of the deceased workers' basic amount. The first bullet seems to say 100% of deceased workers' benefit amount, which I read as including any delayed credits uh, to perhaps 70 years old. The second bullet seems to say if a survivor is not at their full retirement age, then the survivor gets a reduced percentage of deceased workers' basic amount. Basic amount is never defined, but it seems to me PIA with no delayed credits included. Am I reading English correctly? Your loyal and obedient servant, Perry. Oh, Perry. And that's why he's writing this thing all weird. You got a dog named Heinz57. No, a, that a means name. that it's a mutt. <laughs> Oh, Heinz 57 means that it's a, it's all types. I, I'm, oh. Al and I are going with it's a name. I, I think it's should be the name. That's what I would call it. Hey, Heinz 57, that is come over here. It's got a 2013 SUV. YouTube makes this subject clears my, all right. I, I believe <clears throat> this is stating if the, if the person died prior to the widow or widower reaching a benefit age where they could collect. Right. Right. So let's say you pass. So yeah, let's say I waited till 70. So I'm collecting my benefits. I pass at 75. Does Annie get those benefits? So that includes obviously the, the uh, delayed retirement credit. And the answer is yes. Correct. Yeah. Cause, <clears throat> cause when, when the, when one spouse passes, the survivor gets the higher, the two benefits that are currently being paid. Right. That is correct. But you can claim a survivor benefit as early as age 60. Yeah. So let's say, let's say I'm 75 and then I, let's say my wife Anne is 59. 59. And so she claims that at 60, instead of waiting to her full retirement age, then it's a reduced benefit for life. And I think that's right. 71 and a half percent, I think in that example, but I think it's 71 and a half percent of my total benefit, not of what, uh, what, of what I was receiving. Correct. I, I don't think it's, I, I don't, I don't think basic means you don't get the, the, um, they would say a full retirement age amount with yeah. their FRA. Amount. That, that's what I think. I, I, I base, I think that it's 71 and a half percent of whatever my benefit was when I was 75. Because the rules change quite a bit there as well, right? Where you would want to, <clears throat> uh, because this happened to my mother, is that she was still working. My dad died at 61. And then she's like, okay, well, she could claim the benefit at 60, but it didn't make any sense because it still had the same reduction if you had earned income. Right. Right. And it's like, well, take it at full retirement age. So then you don't get the reduction of income, push yours out until age 70 and then right. flip it that way. Sure. So um, yeah, it's clear as mud, Perry. I, I, I will say this, Perry, almost nothing about social security is very clear. It is one of the most complicated things you can imagine. Next time, ask me a question. <laughs> hey, my wife died. <laughs> what benefit can I receive? Yeah, but don't go to the social security websites, start cutting and pasting crap and then sending it to me. So I got to decipher what the hell all this means. Find out more about social security benefits and make sure that you get as much social security as you're legally entitled to receive. Check out Joe and Big Al's recent episode of Your Money, Your Wealth TV, which Gary mentioned earlier. Listen to podcast number 208 with social security expert Mary Beth Franklin and download the social security handbook for free. You can do all of that right in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Now that said, if you need more personalized help, an assessment from 
a certified financial planner on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure Financial Advisors is also free. Watch the show, download the handbook, listen to the podcast, and sign up for a free assessment in the podcast show notes. Just click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, and you're on your way. Now let's find out about those chickens. Uh, greetings, Joe, Big Al, and Andy, John, former chickens owner here, yo, living in rural <laughs> Ohio. I also drive a 1965 Lincoln Continental. I bought when I was 14 with lawn mowing money. A 1965 Lincoln Continental? That's a badass car. That's a big car. I had free range chickens to eat the ticks <laughs> on my two acres. I donated them to a local church as I choose to take six months off uh, social distancing at my family's 100-acre summer cabin in Michigan near Traverse City during the COVID lockdown and shutdown. I took all the eggs with me. I had so many eggs, I always gave them away for free. People miss that. I never plan on eating the chickens. Fortunately, I was one of the first to get the two-dose vaccine and have always and continued to wear a mask. All right. All right, John. Good for you. Okay. Good morning, John. I am a vested public employee, as I said, with a pension replacing 88% or more of my income with a plop. Um, I'm guessing that's kind of like a drop. That's a partial lump sum option payment. Uh, that <clears throat> I will take and invest for my heirs. Also, as a vested public employee, should I become disabled at any time, it acts as a disability pension, paying 100% or more of my income. So my question is, should I fully fund, max out a Roth IRA, first investing in small cap value fund, ETFs? So first and last, I'll leave, what? I'm, I'm confused here. Let, let me do this again. So my question is, should I fully fund, max out a Roth IRA first, investing in small cap value funds? Okay. That's, that's always a good plan. Okay. So first in, last out, leaving for my heirs. Follow so, that? Yeah. So, so that's his first investment, but the last he's going to take out. He wants to leave it for his heirs. Okay, so the Roth IRA is his first investment, small cap value, let it grow. Those well, are yeah. for the heirs. That's the last thing that he's going to spend. That's what I think. Yep. All right. Uh, why don't you just say that? <laughs> it's more words. Got it. Uh, then fully fund and invest my HSA $7,800 a year uh, family plan in small cap value. It's an HSA, John. <laughs> Calm down. Well, he might be young. Well, no, he's not young because he bought a 65 Lincoln Continental. Well, well, when he was could, fourteen, yeah, we don't know what he is now. Um, drawing from his drawing from this at age sixty five as income, but I'd rather it be inherited by my heirs. God, he's such a giving person. He yeah. gives chicken eggs, <laughs> chickens first, chickens then Ross and then, yeah. then HSA plan. HSAs. It's like what else can you give, John? Just give, give, give. Well, if you if someone inherits an HSA. Isn't that fully taxable? It's an IRA. It, it, it's, but it's fully taxable in the first year. It's not a 10 year payout. Like I don't think. Well, it depends on when John dies. I don't think he's going to die for a long time because no. he's a giver. Right. <clears throat> but after 65, if he doesn't use the HSA funds, he could just put it into an IRA. And then if he passes, then they, then, they would then have it, a 10 year. Yeah, that's right. Then they could do a 10 year. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. How does an inherited age? Okay, we talked about that. Uh, then being in low income, forty five hundred dollars, forty five thousand a year, in, um, invest in and fund a brokerage account. Small cap, dude. He loves these small cap values. Yeah, that's for the heirs too. <laughs> because if I do, <laughs> this heirs will get a step up in basis and not have to draw down within ten years. Uh, then invest fund a four fifty seven because there is no early withdrawal penalty, and then invest in fund a four hundred three b. So it's like an order. Like you remember how we used to talk about do this first, invest in your 401k to the match and then go back to the Roth and go back to the 401. I think he's, yeah, he's to, asking about the sequence of savings, trying to come up with the order. Okay. But he put like 17 question marks <laughs> and all I really got out of this is small cap value or uh, that he gives eggs. He's a giver. <laughs> he gives eggs, <laughs> eggs and he's got a badass car. Well, so I think the question is, is this the right order? 
Roth, um, Roth first, then HSA, <laughs> then brokerage account, then, then 457, then 403B. Um, so there, there's probably matches though, right? Well, he's got he's got forty five thousand dollars of forty five thousand a year to invest. So I would go four fifty seven before the brokerage. Then I would go Roth. If I could go four fifty seven Roth, I would probably do that. Because why? Because there's a match. I don't think there's probably a match there's in no the four fifty seven okay. plan. Maybe there's a match in the four hundred three B plan. I doubt it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe he's got a four hundred one A. He works for the city. Or he's a city employee, right? Public employee. Uh, yes. So he's going to have a, a nice pension that he doesn't necessarily need the money. It's all going to go to his heirs. Got it. So yeah, I would try to fund the 457 Roth if they have it. Then go to the Roth IRA. Then go to the HSA if you need health care. But I wouldn't use that as an inheritance play. I would use the brokerage count as the inheritance play. I have two healthy, beautiful daughters, 17 and 13. I claim head of household. My girlfriend has a 20-year-old son who is disabled. Uh, and gifted with special needs. Should I set up an ABLE account for him? $1,400 a year up to 14000 $14, a year up to 170000 so it doesn't affect his benefits. Do I and or when will I need a financial <laughs> advisor? I just don't want to make any mistakes. Thanks, gentlemen. You always make me laugh. Best podcast ever. Um, I ran out of time because you kept on asking questions, John. <laughs> Um, yeah, if, if, if your girlfriend's got a disabled, um, child, the able account is, is a great way to go that can give them some safety net, some cash without hurting his social security benefits. Um, if you have the cash flow to do that, um, I think that's a really good way to go as well. I think he's on the right track. I don't think he's making any mistakes. He's going to have the cash flow that he needs from his pension. He's going to marry, um, or he's got a, a two lovely kids and a beautiful girlfriend. Yep. Nice car. It's got eggs. It's got, it's got it all. Well, I, he might He's have... got a hundred acre farm that he just goes to and wears a mask by himself. He's... <laughs> I think he gave his chickens away there. No. So no, no, many, no more eggs. No more chickens. No, I think, I mean, so we talked about the sequence of savings and the ABLE plan is a great plan if you have a disabled child. So yeah, I would, I would fund that to the extent you can. All right. Hello, Steve from San Diego writes in. For years, I've been putting money regularly into mutual funds. Now that I'm retired and will be drawing money from them in the near future, I was wondering if there was a way to help decide on what category to pull the money out of to save on taxes. Hmm. Okay. They give me choices like first in, first out, average cost, etc. Is there anything I should consider before I decide on what choice? I should make when I pull the money out. All right. Uh, let me break that down for you, Big Al. Okay. I believe Steve is referring to a brokerage account. Yes, he would have to be. Because if you pull money out of the IRA, it doesn't matter what method you use because it's all oh. or, ner or all or near income. It, and, well, unless, unless there's the basis. pro rata. <laughs> Let's not go there, please. <laughs> I suppose. I guess you got the pro rata aggregation rules yeah, on true. the back door, super door. <laughs> back that's true. Right there, right? That's another discussion. Uh, it'll come up, guaranteed. Yeah, I know. So in a brokerage account, so you, you have options on when you sell stocks to create income or to, to use some of that asset for whatever that you choose to. And he's like, first in, first out. So... What does that mean? Oh, you want me to answer? Well, okay. I'm, well, sure. So, so we we'll want some dialogue with you. Buddy. <laughs> okay. So what that means is that, so let's say you've been buying some of the mutual fund periodically over time, right? And so first in, first out means that the first shares that you sell, the cost basis will be the first shares that you purchased, which usually is the lowest, lower, right. which means higher gain, because usually, not always, usually the stock market goes up over time. So usually your older shares, your first shares have a lower cost basis and therefore a higher gain. So that's usually your worst answer in terms of taxation. Unless you're in a super low tax bracket. 
sure. because then you want to use first in first out because then at capital gains it's zero yeah so, so you want to yeah. utilize those. that's right so if you're in the 12 percent bracket which is about forty thousand dollars taxable income single about eighty thousand taxable income married and you can only have your capital gains go up to that level if you go over then they're of course they're taxed at capital gain rate so that that's right that might be a way to go but i think on for most of our listeners, that would not be your first choice, I would say. Yeah, you would fill up those brackets probably with IRA dollars yeah, first, yeah, right? Right. Um, so, all right, first in, first out. So, another example, or I guess a real life example, is that you bought the this um, the XYZ mutual fund, and you have a cost basis of one dollar a share. Then it's three dollars a share. Then it's five dollars a share. Now today you buy it, it's ten dollars a share. Sure. And you sell first in, first out is whatever you sell is going to be that dollar basis. Yeah, that, that's, that's going to use the very that first one that you purchased. Yeah. <clears throat> average cost is just going to be the average of all of the cost of um, all the basis that, that you purchase throughout the years. Yeah. And I, and I would say on mutual funds, that's probably what most people do. And that's probably the best answer for most people. Right. When you say, yeah, and I, it, it really depends on what the basis is on all of this because. If he's held mutual funds for a long time and has reinvest dividends, right? You know the cost of what he purchased it for in his true cost basis is going to be something completely different because those reinvested dividends increase the basis oh, along sure. the way. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's a whole other topic which <laughs> no one will understand. But it's you're right. The the thing is you have different cost basis all along. So he doesn't mention last in first step, right? Is that is that available for the brokerage account? Do you know, Joe? Uh, well, last in first out. Yeah. Meaning that they'll, no, they'll, I understand when last in first out. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if that's available or not. I've never even checked. I think first, first in first out and average cost is probably the most common. In some cases you can do specific identification, yep. right? So you can actually say, you know what? I want these shares that I bought on January 2nd. 2007. I want, I want to, I want to sell those first because those, you know, those have a high basis before the crash or, or whatever. Right? right. I mean, if there's FIFO, there's gotta be LIFO, right? Yeah. You would think so. Like annuities is always last in first out because they always yeah. want the ordinary income to come out first, but I'm not sure. And bro they changed the rules. I know they did. That, that's why I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. So last in first out would just simply mean the last shares that you bought actually are the ones that are sold. I'm not sure if that's a typically an option or not, but Anyway, that that could be the best option in a rising market. Right. right. Or you could just specify which ones you, you want could. to sell. But most of us, myself included, don't want to go to all that hassle. Yeah, and I right? mean, yeah, it's a pain in the ass. It for is. Sure. I'd rather just use average costs and call it good. <laughs> yeah. Every time you sell, you get a new average cost because or well, every time you every time you buy, you get a new average cost. Yeah. And I think, Steve, if, if as long as you understand what first in, first out, last in first or last in, last out and average cost means then you could do some analysis to see what yeah. makes sense. And you might just want to just say average cost is good because it might save me a couple of yeah. bucks each year. Well, that's if what I I'm saying. I, I think most people could don't want to do the analysis. So just do average cost. Good enough. All right. Uh, David, he writes in, he goes, hello again from NYC. I think this is my fourth question in two years. Um, and thanks for all your previous answers. There were some radical bits of info in the podcast 326. The suggestions on how to consume, not read, of course, God forbid, anywhere from eight to 400 books a day is worth trying. Slightly less radical, uh, but something I never heard before, uh, because it's not typical advice, was in this exchange about taxes to pay for Roth conversions. Many thanks to Andy's mother for the transcript. Um, so now you're going to actually read word for word what you said. No, I'm not. <laughs> <You're> not? <laughs> I think what our exchange was is yeah. that we rarely tell people to pay taxes out of the IRA on a conversion, on a conversion. Right. That's right. Unless you have a very large retirement account with very little liquidity and large fixed income. Yeah. Like, like, let's say you got high social security and maybe a high pension and a bunch of money in a 401k and an IRA and no other money outside of retirement, then you might be a good candidate. For yeah. That. And we would almost always probably tell people to do home equity first. Yeah. Because it's cheaper money than paying tax to pay right. tax to pay the tax. Right. And, and by doing that, you have other money to pay the tax. You get a lot more money into a Roth IRA. So this basically describes my situation. 
uh, we're, we're back to David here. Okay. Uh, because most of my traditional IRA money came from a 401k that was primarily invested in stock firms from the 1980s to 2010. And the market cooperated with great returns. The balance now is slightly more than $3 million. I was late to being, uh, I was late to begin converting any of that to Roth. And that balance now is 130000 I don't have a pension, but I do have a variable annuity worth 157000 Why an annuity? I invested about $25,000 in 1994 in the tax deferral since I was maxing out my IRA and 401k contributions. I didn't consider the tax implications 30 some odd years later, and there was no YMYW to set me straight. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I'm 69, and I have two plus years before RMDs hit. Other info, I'm married. My wife is still working. She has a stock-heavy 401k of about a million dollars, a modest traditional IRA, and a very small Roth. Plus, she'll have a pension when she finally retires, but has no immediate plans to do so. I've been paying the Roth conversion taxes via estimated taxes each quarter from cash flow created by Social Security and our taxable brokerage account, which is throwing off dividends and cap gain distros uh, that aren't being in re reinvested. Do you say distros? I've never said that word. <laughs> I get what he means there. Distros, capital gain distros. distros. Distributions for yeah. all the rest of you. It's a little short for distributions. Right. Distros. Yeah. Um, that aren't being reinvested. And this is why my monthly spending money comes from. Uh, there are usually some extra cash beyond taxes spending to reallocate. There's some money in CDs that we started back when interest rates were 2% or more, uh, but are maturing soon. So those funds seem fine to pay the taxes. But otherwise, tax money is coming from dividends and cap gains that hypothetically could be reinvested in the brokerage account for better returns. So paying tax from the brokerage account seems to come with an opportunity cost. Both the brokerage account and the traditional IRA are essentially allocated in a 60-40 stock bond uh, cash split. The Roth is all stock. I've learned that lesson. Uh, so theoretically, the rate of return should be similar unless I change the allocation. So finally, the question. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Is this a case where you think paying for conversions is better from withholding from the IRA? I've tried to model things out, assuming a modest 5% annual average return for the next 15 years in both cases, since the asset allocations are similar. But I don't know if I've considered all factors. And of course, there's no way to know what the future Fed and NYC tax rates on capital gains, dividends, distros from traditional IRAs, et cetera, are going to be a year from now, much less 10 or 20 years from now. What else should I try to factor into this decision? Thanks for considering what seems to be a pretty mind-bending situation. So what do you think? Uh, no, I don't know what he's modeling. He Pay the tax outside of the, the, yeah, the IRA. I agree. You got you. It sounds you didn't you didn't tell us how the, much the, you have a non qualified, but you have enough dividends to pay the taxes. Do that, right? But it's case, always going to be yes. It's, yeah, it's and, a cheaper tax rate. And if you don't have enough money for dividends, then just cash out some of the stock because I'd rather pay capital gains on stock, which would be a lot lower rate than paying ordinary income to pay the tax, right? On a on a conversion, right? But the, the issue is that he's all right. So if I if I sell some of my brokerage account, he's like, well, there's an opportunity cost. Yes, I get that. But let's just assume you have the exact same investment in the brokerage account and the exact same investment in. The IRA, which essentially he says he does. Right. Right. And if he takes the money from the IRA, the opportunity cost is a lot larger because he has to take the money out to pay tax to pay the additional tax. Yes. So it's tax upon tax and it's a larger tax than a capital gains tax. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, it's 100 percent tax coming out of the IRA. Secondly, it's ordinary income. When you sell a stock, you're only paying capital gains, which is a lower tax on the gain part, not the whole thing. So you're you're absolutely right. Your opportunity cost is is much greater doing it out of the IRA. So I don't know. Mind bending. <laughs> pretty straightforward, David. I think, yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward too. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pay the tax, 
any which way you can um, at the last resort, then see, pay it out of the see, IRA. We, we said pay the tax out of your IRA when you don't have any non-qualified brokerage money. Yeah. And, and you he's, have and he's high, got distros. Yeah. And, and you have high, <laughs> a lot of money in a 401k and high pension. So you don't quite qualify, David, for our, I guess, podcast 326. Yes. He just doesn't want to do it. I know because he, he likes those investments. I know he does. Yeah. I know he does. I made so much money here and I just don't want to. Oh, just it, oh, it pains me. He likes to see the brokerage account. And he's like, it'd just be easier if I just withhold the taxes on the conversions. Right. How, how about this? You just so you, you, you get more money into Roth because you have you're not withholding on the conversion and you get and you pick the same investments that you like so much in the Roth. Right. And then you then you end up better. Right. <laughs> right. So that's the issue. He's got an emotional attachment yes. towards the brokerage account I, that he doesn't want to drain down. I would agree with that. So. All right. Thanks for the uh, question, David. Now is the time to send in your questions, comments and chicken stories by clicking Ask Joe and Al on air in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. While you do have the option to either record your question in a voice message or send an email, I'm going to give you a little hint. Joe loves the recorded messages. So generally, they're going to go to the top of the email list, no matter how long that list is. Now, we know you've got your money questions and you know that Joe and Big Al have answers and massive derails and questions about your cars and your pets and your livestock. The point is, those messages you send us are the reason that YMYW exists, and they're the source of the info that the fellows share and the entertainment that they provide. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app to go to the show notes. You can read the episode transcript, access all the free financial resources, and ask Joe and Big Al on air. Uh, let's see. Okay, we got Amelia Earhart. Earhart. Yeah. Isn't that the pilot? Yeah, yeah. Rose raised from the dead. All right. I wonder, if she's, I wonder what she's got to say. She's got to be a little bit older, don't you think? Oh, she loves YMYW. <laughs> she was listening. To... <laughs> All right. Hi, Andy, Joe, and Big Al. Thanks for your great show uh, that keeps me educated and entertained while driving kids to crew practice seven days a week. Wow. Amelia. <laughs> they should rename the sport Cruel. Uh, yeah. Rather than crew. I agree with that. No. Uh, brief background. Happily married, blessed with three kids, 17, 15, 12, live in Maryland, maxing out qualified retirement accounts, feel okay about uh, the retirement planning they're doing. Okay. My question is about 529 plans. Given the scary cost of college, ever since our kids were born, we've been saving into our state's 529 plan as much as we can. With help from the kids' loving grandparents, we've amassed approximately $200,000 in the high schoolers' accounts, a little less than that for the younger kid. The problem is that so much is unknown about college costs. Will we get merit aid? I don't think we'll qualify for any need-based aid. Will our kids continue to grad school with costs yet another ton of money? Based on family statistics, chances are high. You think they're they're in crew? <laughs> I, I, mean, I would they're say be doctors. I would say it's highly likely. <laughs> doctors seven days attorneys. a week. They're in crew. Now I think they're going to be bums. <laughs> well, I guess you could have said we we do we play polo. <laughs> then we'd really know. Well, between polo practice <laughs> and crew, <laughs> they read the encyclopedia every night. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a TV. <laughs> we have books. <laughs> or some of my kids listen to audiobooks at triple speed. <laughs> oh, he just cured cancer <laughs> at 12. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. I think they are going to grad school. Yes, I think so. Uh, uh, well, they have the mercy. They go to uh, a state public school. Let's see. Dream on, Amelia, et cetera. The full cost of a private college these days is about $80,000 a year times four times a year. That's $320,000. And that's before grad school. My question is about ramifications of oversaving to the 529. I know we're allowed to rejigger money between our different kids, but what are the consequences of overdoing it altogether? The prospect of having 529 plan money left over growing <clears throat> that could be gifted to our grandkids later sounds appealing, but I have read about a generation skipping trust. Dex. 
Oh, generation skipping tax. Yeah. Well, you could put it in a generation skipping <laughs> trust okay. to avoid the generation GST tax. tax. Yeah, right. A forty percent for passing this down one generation. Uh, there are also strict and harder, uh, hard to follow rules about renaming the beneficiaries of 529 plans. Can you please share your thoughts about ramifications of oversaving in 529 plans with an eye towards helping future grandkids? May we be blessed with some. Thanks for discussing my question, and I hope uh, you keep your excellent show running forever, or at least until kid number three uh, can drive herself to cruel. <laughs> if you select my question, please email me. Um, please email me so I'm sure not to miss it. Okay. Right. Overfunding 529 plans. So you got ordinary income tax and a 10% penalty on any other growth. Sure. So if, you, if you don't use it for education, you always get your basis back. True. Um, but the growth is going to be taxed at ordinary income plus uh, a 10% penalty. So then you got to do some planning here. You have three kids and they're all doing crew seven yeah. days a week there are probably going to be some scholarships I'm, I'm i'm guessing could be um but if there's grad school and things like that they already have a few hundred thousand dollars in it right if you don't feel comfortable because the, the true benefit of a 529 plan is tax-free growth and tax-free withdrawals upon using it for qualified educational expenses sure if you put the money into a non-qualified account and have a tax efficient strategy, let, let's say that you're making sure that you're rebalancing and tax loss harvesting and things like that, uh, the cap gain rates are going to be lower than ordinary income in yeah. a 10% penalty. So maybe you split it up that way. Yeah, I, I think so. Although I think there's still a lot of room. A couple, hundred, of room. Th couple hundred thousand with three, three kids, kids that are probably going on to higher education after call it you know after college so i think there's plenty of room but i think that's right i think you kind of split it between the two you, you don't want to overdo it but on the other hand you know maybe you do save it for the grandkids and i i don't think there's a generation skipping tax unless you're over the exemption the exemption limits. of course so right, you, right now the exemption limit's 11 and a half million per person although that could come down so that could be a factor later okay well i don't know maybe amelia has 22 maybe. million dollar net worth maybe maybe 50 million <laughs> So I guess if, if Amelia, you have a $22 million net worth, that's also increasing with inflation. Sure. Um, you know, don't worry about the generation skipping tax unless you've already gifted and you feel that you will have an estate tax issue. Sure. If you have an estate tax issue, then that's one thing. Um, so I don't know what your net worth is, but I would imagine it's probably pretty high because of. Because <laughs> of cruel. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a I think it's expensive. Guess. Yeah, I think it probably here, costs ten thousand dollars just to look at that boat. Here, here's the other tip that it's high. Uh, she wouldn't give her regular name. Yes, Amelia. <laughs> Amelia Earhart. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't worry too much about the generation skipping. I would plan on, you know, fully funding, you know, two two kids. Yeah, here's another thing is is even if you overfund it, which doesn't seem likely with three kids that are going to go on and on and on in education, but let's say they do. And then as you get a little bit older and need something to do, you go back to college, you you keep learning, you have a lifetime of learning, yeah. and you can use those funds learn, for that. Learn how to fly a plane. Learn, yeah, <laughs> not, a little better not, than not, the first yeah, time. A little bit better than the first time. <laughs> right. New equipment. Um, but the last point I would like to make, though, yeah. is to make sure that your retirement is buttoned up. You sure. know what I mean? So if you're worried about overfunding it because you need that dollar, you need those dollars for your own retirement. I'm, I'm assuming that's not the case. Right. Uh, but we have seen people overfund college or, you know, not fund their own retirement for their kids college that totally blows them up in their overall retirement. Right. Now, or they're taking on their kids' student loans of two, three hundred thousand dollars when they only have you know, $150,000 saved for their own retirement and they're in their 60s, right? So you, you want to make sure that you take care of you first for your retirement. You can always take loans out for college. You can't take a loan out for your retirement. So Amelia, thanks for the question. Uh, Mike writes in from San Diego. I have about a million dollars in equity, around $500 in my owner-occupied house and a little more than that a rental property. I want to refi both 
to get a better rate and buy another rental. What are the rules about interest deduction on a mortgage exceeding the purchase price of my existing property? Ah, that's a great question. And it's uh, somewhat complicated, but I'll, I'll try to explain it simply as I can. So basically the IRS says, if you, if you borrow money on a property, whether it's a rental or your home, you can only deduct the interest that you use to, to buy the property. That's called purchase money interest or improve the property. That's considered purchase money interest. Now, in this case, what Mike is thinking of doing is basically refining to where he gets cash out, right? So he's borrowing more and he's going to use it for another rental property. And believe it or not, that's, that's okay. Because the thing is, to the extent that you took cash out, then the IRS has these rules called interest tracing rules, which just means that you can deduct that interest but not on the not, not all of it on the property that you borrowed it on. You have to trace it to where those funds went to, and then you deduct it against that new rental property. So it's a little tricky to report. In, in other words, like on your home, you report all of it on Schedule A as a deduction, so it matches the Form 1098, but then you back out the part that goes to Schedule E on your rental. So you end up with a lower amount on Schedule A, the itemized deductions, and you put the rest on Schedule E which is your rental property schedule. So that's the mechanics of how to do it. But the, the quick and easy answer is you can do this as long as you're using the money for an, another investment, you'll be able to deduct it, but you, you're gonna have to trace those rules and deduct the interest on another schedule. All right. Um, I guess the next question is, should he do it? <laughs> I know he's not asking us. He is. Yeah, there's, there's some problems potentially. In a rising market, you'll never have a problem. Well, I shouldn't say never, never but no. you, you rarely have a problem. In a declining market, big problem. I can tell you from experience. And I, I can't tell you, Mike, how many books I read that warned about this. And I still tried to, even as an accountant, I said, okay, I'm only going to buy this property because it cash flows. And then, and then it goes up and I refinance. Okay, I'm going to buy another one. It cash flows so no matter what. I'll be able to cash flow this thing in all kinds of markets. Well, guess what? The Great Recession happened, and the properties that I was renting for twelve hundred a month, I couldn't even get seven hundred a month. I mean, no one had money to pay rent, yeah. and so therefore, I didn't have money to pay the mortgage, and that's the problem. So, the more homes you buy in a rising market, the quicker you can grow your wealth. But just understand, there's more risk, and pretty much. Every single real estate guru that I read their books, if they were honest, and many of them are, basically went through a story on how they lost everything. And so they did it differently <laughs> the next time. And in, in some cases, they lost everything twice because it's, <laughs> it's, it's a hard lesson to learn. So the, the fact of the matter is the more properties you buy, the faster you can grow the wealth, but the more risky it is and the more chance in a downturn, you could lose your properties. So what... Would you take money out of your primary resident to purchase a rental property? I, I have, and I don't recommend it <laughs> because you're kind of putting your own property at risk in a major downturn. And you think, well, I mean, if properties go down 10%, who cares? But in the Great Recession, I had some properties in Las Vegas, and they went down 70%, 70, okay? So a property that was, was you know, I bought for a couple hundred thousand, right? Was now worth whatever that works out to be 60,000. I mean, no joke. And, and I couldn't afford the rent and the mortgage was 120, 140. Yeah. <laughs> Those are scary times. And yep. that could happen again. Yep. It happened during the, the great depression. It happened during the great recession. It happened in the nineties. Now in the nineties in California, it only went down where we're at. Uh, and Mike, you're in San Diego. It went down about 20%, which isn't 50 or 70%, but still, 20%, if you don't have other resources to cover your cash flow and, and let the economy recover, you're at risk. So just be aware of that. So he's got a million dollars in equity. And so I remember the term like debt equity, right? Yeah. You have debt equity. Yeah, right. So you, you want to- You, 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 you got to put that to work. You do because you're not, you, don't have enough, you don't have enough property for that equity for your growth. And, and, and that is true. And you remember when you and I first met, I had all this equity- on paper <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then it all slipped away <laughs> so it mike it really does happen so just be careful on that uh, big al you got a big net worth statement yeah until i didn't 
<laughs> but I'll tell you what, I learned a lot of lessons and I still own rental property, Mike. I like rental property. I'm just more careful now. Yeah, I would. Um, and I, we don't know how old Mike is. No, we don't. As long as you have cash flow and time. So if he's got a, a really good job that he is dependable, but who, but who knows? What, what yeah. was a dependable job? I, I know. In, yeah. in a bad economy, you, you don't know. And I, I guess one real estate, one apartment real estate broker who I like and trust, he told me once, and I agree with this. He said, for every property you buy, have at least three months rental income in reserve just to set aside. And I think that's good advice. And maybe you even want more for safety, but at least have that. Yeah. And did I have that? No, I did. Well, you had a lot of doors. I I had had a lot of, (laughs) I kept using my money to buy more doors. (laughs) All right. Well, good luck, Mike. Hopefully that helps. Listening at high speed once again, color and context, the bomb and crew practice are in the derails. So stick around. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the get an assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 and schedule a free financial assessment video call at the time and date that is convenient for you. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. The suggestions on how to consume, not read, of course, God forbid, anywhere from eight to 400 books a day is worth trying. You probably made audiobook publishers very happy about all that. Have you done like eight or 15, 20 books a day at, at like quadruple speed? No, I haven't. That joke's yeah. getting old now. It is. I know. <laughs> Just trying to add some color behind his comment. Right. Slightly. That's, that's one of my new favorite words. Color. Could yeah. you add some color? Yes. <laughs> I, want to, I want to give you some context. <laughs> we hear that a lot these days, it yes, seems. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, that, that used to be the bomb, right? The bomb. That was when, when you say the bomb out. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds a little funny. It does. <laughs> Every time I try to say something like <laughs> modern, like what did I say like a couple years ago? I don't know. Oh, oh I know what I said. What'd you I say? said I want to give a shout out <laughs> to and you. Go shout out, out. That's another generation. And that's not what you say. <laughs> oh, want to give a shout out. <laughs> John, you're the bomb. Are those suicide doors? Yes, they are. Oh, that is a can't... badass car. Wow, that's the same car in the the, the Maroon Five commercial. That Ooh. one I don't know. Yep. Or not commercial, but video crew practice. Yeah, how about that? What huh? is that? Is that like um, what's crew? Is that where Harvard and Yale they just kind of go in those boats and? Right. You know, I, I I do think it has to do with um, Pat rowing, maybe. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, I mean that's elite. That's yeah, an elite. It's elite. That's a that's a you know got to make a lot of money for that. <laughs> that's, that's a very elite sport. We have we have someone in our office that likes to row. It's not our, crew. It's pa- not row. It's paddle. Yeah, I, I always get that wrong. Yeah. It's paddling. Yeah, it's like a, the Hawaiian paddleboard. Yeah, but she's she's in a she's in a boat with. Whatever you call that. Yeah, but it's not crew. Crew's like badass. <laughs> I think she's kind of badass when she well, does her events. I, well, I, I, we did the events I, together. I know. Right. And if I could do it, if yeah, you but, could do it that together was, in that the was, same boat. But that was the amateur. So they'd raise money for the real people. Got it. All right. I, I believe. Seven days a week. They got to be ripped, too. That's tough. Have you ever, like, rowed um, a rowing machine? Yeah, it is hard. Oh, my and, God. And afterwards, you're, you're dead. <laughs> Oh, just it will blow you up, right? 